Hi, this is Michael Bofer, and let's get ready for Baylorick TV. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Wherever you are in the world, my name is Ingram Jones, and I have with me the manager of Lucas Brown, Matt Clark. Matt, how are you doing? Very good, pal. Yourself? Fine, thanks. Uh, so we call is live and direct from Australia, correct? That's correct, mate. It's now uh, 10 p.m. here in Queensland. Fantastic. So, without further ado, let's get into things. Uh, Matt, before we talk about, obviously, Lucas Brown as, as the, the fighter you've got, who else do you sort of manage as well? And what, you know, your role and what do you do? Yeah, I've um, got a couple of uh, good talents on the books. Uh, obviously, Lucas is probably the most well-known. Um, got former European middleweight champion Kerry Hope, um, who unfortunately uh, suffered a, a terrible injury uh, just last weekend. He was fighting for a, a regional WBA strap here in in Australia against a hot uh, prospect and it was a great fight, uh, back and forth action, probably the fight of the year domestically in Australia and uh, Kerry was right in the fight but unfortunately suffered a broken jaw so he's he's had an operation today which is which is terrible and uh, he's announced his retirement. Um, apart from Kerry, I've got Damian Hooper and Cameron Hammond, two uh, Olympians from, from 2012 in London. Uh, Brandon Ogilvy, who's um, one of Australia's hottest prospects, if not the hottest prospect. He's um, ranked by the WBA at lightweight. And, um, you know, a couple of kids uh, that are domestic level Australian kids. OK, great. Fantastic. Thank you so much for agreeing to do the interview with Baylorick TV, by the way. Not a problem. Anytime. OK, so let's get into things. Lucas Brown, the fight has been announced. Um, it's been over social media for a few days now. Shannon Briggs and Lucas Brown. I spoke to Lucas yesterday via social media and saying to him, look, Lucas, you sure you don't know that this fight's going to be arranged? He said to me, no, I, it's nothing's confirmed. And then, bang, we discovered today the fight's been arranged. How much did you know about this Shannon yeah. Briggs situation? Next to nothing, <laughs> to be honest with you. Um, your guess was as good as mine. Uh, if you recall, like over the, the past sort of month or whatever, one day it's... Um, Vladimir Klitschko, the next day there's rumours about Houston Holtz, the next day after that it's David Haig. It was um, finally obviously decided today, uh, this morning Australian time, that it was Shannon Briggs. And that, you're right, those rumours were fighting about the internet for a day or two. But, I mean, we just got to the point where we we weren't believing anything until we, we were told. And uh, this morning we found out, obviously. You tell me, uh, Shannon Briggs knew this information. How did Shannon Briggs know this information and you guys didn't know about the information? Well, yeah, look, Shannon was probably... Oh, look, Shannon's probably feeding off the, the rumours as well, I'm guessing. Um, you know, there was... Like I said, there was rumours flying all over the net. So, I mean, we could have come out and sort of said, oh, yeah, look, this will be announced in, in a day or two. But my my guess is that Shannon probably knew about as much as everyone else. So, um, but, yeah, Shannon talks a good game. That's what he does best. OK. So, we know the fight is on. Let's ba Let's backtrack a bit because there's been a lot of talk about... Lucas Brown fighting this person, Lucas Brown fighting that person, and negotiations <laughs> going on with Lucas Brown. You're his manager, so you know what negotiations, or you should know what negotiations have been going on. <laughs> let's, ta let's take a little talk, uh, 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 let's go track back a bit. There was a lot of talk about Klitschko possibly going to fight Joshua. If he wasn't going to fight Joshua, Lucas Brown was the next person who was lining up. For my information... It was Klitschko was aiming for Joshua first, and Lucas Brown was something on the back burner. That if the Joshua fight fell through, talk to us about what you know about this situation. Yeah, I'd, I'd say you probably got that right. I think your information is probably spot on. Um, there was some talk between his camp and our camp. Um, my guess is that he he basically had you know one foot in in the Joshua sort of side of things and one foot in the Lucas Brown side of things, and somewhere along the along the way he's developed a calf strain so he's out anyway but um, yeah there was some talk but as uh, Lucas's lawyer Leon Magulli said that it wasn't like a, a big you know sort of negotiation or anything like that I think there was a few phone calls and you know there were days and days where we were hearing nothing from anyone so no I think it was probably overblown a little bit I mean look I even saw it was posted on box track and all this sort of stuff and it was so far away from that yeah, it's not funny. So what? So what was the stumbling block to prevent or to stop a fight between Brown 
and Klitschko for the title? Because now Shannon Briggs is fighting for the title. He is, yeah. Well, I don't think there really was a stumbling block apart from maybe Vladimir Klitschko being injured or, or losing interest or something like that. So, you know, Lucas Brown will fight his own shadow if you pay him enough. So he's not really bothered about who he fights or anything like that. He obviously wants to be compensated for it. It's him that's taking the hits in the ring, but he's not afraid of anyone. That's a, that's a fact. Um, so, you know, if, if it had been Klitschko, if the WBA said to us this morning that you're fighting Klitschko, well, we'd be fighting Klitschko if it was you know, any of those other names, used to not pay, Quenda, whoever, that's who we'd be fighting. He, he doesn't really duck or dive. I mean, look, you know, the proof is in the pudding. He, he flew to, well, we flew to, to Grozny and, you know, he's knocked out Ruslan Shagayev in, in Grozny. I can tell you that wasn't a very popular result over there at the time. Mm-hmm. So he's not afraid of anyone. We're definitely going to go back and talk about that Shagayev fight and, and the stuff that was surrounding that. But I want to kind of track back in time a bit. So you had Klitschko, you had Joshua, no, you had Klitschko, you had, you've got Shannon Briggs. There was also David Hay. He says, well, I understand that um, Lucas Brown was trying to get himself in the middle of situations and causing a whole, he, he was basically causing confusion um, what are your take? What's your take on that? No, I think that's a little bit off the mark, to be honest. I mean, look, I like David Hay as a fighter. He's he's fun to watch. He comes out, you know, swinging for the hills and all the rest of it. But you know, he's another one. I think he he talks a better game than than he, than he boxes these days. Um, you know, like I said, we were we we're at the um, I suppose the mercy for lack of better words of the WBA. They needed to tell us who we were fighting and. And then sanction the bout. If it was David Hay, well, we'd now be talking about Lucas Brown versus David Hay. We'd have no problem with that. So, um, you know, David's obviously after after a title, and I think, correct me if I'm wrong, I think he might be going the WBO route now anyway, where he fight, uh, fights the winner of um, Parker and Ruiz, if, if that's to be believed. So, Just the WBO no, I think that's going down sort of yeah. So yeah, the WBO, that, exactly. Yeah. So, so- so how close was a fight between Lucas Brown and, and David Hay? It was a fight that was talked about and talked about and all over social media. This fight's going to happen. This fight's going to happen. How, did David Hay ever contact yeah. your camp? Sorry, repeat did that David, last bit. I just missed it. Did, did David Hay ever contact your camp? Well, he certainly didn't contact me, that's for sure. But um, I've got an idea that at some stage he's contacted Ricky Hatton, you know, Lucas's promoter and and sounded him out. But, I mean, you know, that happens in boxing every day of the week, doesn't it? Like, there's always fights being sounded out and this and that. But I think our stance was always... We, we were we were guaranteed by way of court order, obviously, to, to be fighting for the vacant title. So it was just a matter of who. And you can't really dictate that. That gets dictated to you. So, you know, we've sat there and waited very patiently, I think, for, um, for that news to come to light. Uh, you know, every day I was sort of waking up and checking Twitter and social media and my emails, obviously, and all the rest of it for, for an update. And some days there was nothing, and other days there were, you know, little bits and pieces. But today is the day that we found out that it will be Briggs. So, so, so WBA David, decided to Briggs, and that's so, who it is. So the David Hay thing's been nothing more than talk, and there's nothing real, nothing really serious about that? I don't believe so, no. No. Okay. I mean, like I said, we're happy to... Lucas will fight anyone. You know, if the money's there, you'll fight him. No problems at all. But to my knowledge, it's... We have to wait to for the WBA to tell us who we're fighting, and that's happened today. Okay, Fred Quendo, what about him? Yeah, Fred. Uh, well, obviously, after Fred fought Ruslan Shagayev, they had a um, a court ordered rematch. I believe that uh, the story is that Fred was not going to fight Shagayev. I believe he had um, his wife might have had a medical issue or something along those lines. Um, so they guaranteed him a rematch. Uh, he lost a very close fight over there in Grozny. I believe a majority decision. Um, and I think they reneged on that sort of rematch, so he took them to court in New York, mm-hmm. and uh, the New York Court of Appeal found that, yeah, he was entitled to a rematch. So if you remember, he was going to actually have that rematch, and then he injured his um, his shoulder, his rotor cuff or whatever it is, and um, required surgery, which I, I don't know too much about that injury, to be honest, but I believe it's major surgery. So he's been off on the sidelines for a while, one of the conditions of us fighting Shagaya was that, you know, we were to defend against Aquendo. So we had no problem with that. Um, and then obviously, after knocking out Shagaya, uh, you know, she hit the fan and um, we had another battle on our hands, obviously. So um, my understanding is that um, Aquendo 
well, we have to fight. The winner of Briggs and, and Brown has to fight Aquino in 120 days. Um, if if he's fit and healthy, which I assume he will be by then. So if that's what we've got to do, well, that's what we have to do. Okay. The WBA. Now, there was the situation of Luis Ortiz being the interim champion. There's the WBA super champion, who would have been Tyson Fury. There's the vacant WBA yep. title. What is going on? <laughs> yeah, your uh, your guess is as good as mine. I believe now, correct me if I'm wrong, I think the resolution issue today states that Ortiz is no longer the interim champion. He's fighting Malik Scott for the Intercontinental title, which Lucas used to hold. Um, Lucas will fight Briggs for the regular title. And at that point in time, there is no one above it. So obviously they've come out today and said that you know, they reserve the right or whatever to sanction the super title between Klitschko and Joshua. But who's to say that fight even gets made? I don't know. I mean, it's, it's all well and good to say that that title can be on the line. But I don't know. Will those two camps come to an agreement? I'm, I'm not so sure. Who knows? So all I know is that when Lucas fights Shannon Briggs, there'll be no title above it. It's it's for the WBA and the HM to it all. So wait. Luis Lu- Lu- Ortiz, let me get this right. Luis Ortiz, who was the interim champion, is now going to fight for an intercontinental title. Now, if I'm correct, that's a lower, lower, uh, kind of prestige title. Uh, caliber, I suppose. Yeah, caliber. Yeah, that's yeah I one. believe you're yeah. right. I think, I think what happened was that he was going to fight Houston, if you remember, and they yes. came to um, sign the contracts, and something happened along the lines there where he didn't he didn't fulfil his his mandatory to fight. Used enough because they went all the way to purse bid and, and all that sort of stuff. So I think in today's resolution, they said that he'd relinquished the belt um, because he'd failed to comply with um, defending it anyway. So uh, I guess they're eliminating one of the titles by getting rid of the interim then. And, um, and moving forward, he's going to fight for the Intercontinental title, obviously, to keep his WBA ranking up high. That'd be my guess. But then that still freezes them out for what? Another, I've got no, you've got the Briggs fight first, then should you beat Briggs? Then you've got Fraser Quindo. Where does Alouz Ortiz fit in, in that sort of movement in terms of trying to become WBA champion? Yeah, that, well, <laughs> that's Alouz Ortiz's problem as far as I'm concerned. But, um, I mean, look, yeah. Uh, I mean, he's probably going to look at all these options, I guess. If um, Correct me if I'm wrong, but he's now with Matt Room, with Eddie Hearn, and, and Eddie's got Joshua. So whether he starts moving in IBF circles with Joshua, I don't know. Maybe that is something they'll look at. Um, I believe he's well. He won't be rated anywhere else because he was deemed a title holder by the WBA. So obviously that pretty much excludes him from getting ranked by the other three belts. But now that he's not a title holder per se with the interim belt, my assumption is that he will now be ranked by the WBC, the IBF, and the WBO. So that'll be interesting to see where he pops up. He might actually suddenly have a lot of options that aren't actually exclusive to the WBA. Okay. So then, how comes Luke Lewis Ortiz didn't fight um, Lucas Brown? I don't, I don't understand yeah, that because Lewis Ortiz was the highest ranked fighter around if he was the interim champion. But Shannon Briggs, who has fought really nobody of note recently of time in WBA ranking, has suddenly got a shot for the vacant title. I, 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 this is not a knock on Lucas or you. No. It's just, I don't understand no. that. Yeah, well, <laughs> that's boxing politics, my friend, isn't it? <laughs> We've seen it all before, but I suppose that um, if he's fighting Malik Scott and he's down to fight on the Joshua card, uh, Joshua and Molina card on December 10th, yep. perhaps they're saying that he's already got prior commitments and he's, he's not there for an available contender. I don't know that. That's that's just my guesswork, to be honest with you. Um, I mean, you know, Klitschko in the, in the latest rankings that came out today, I think he's rated number two. So, um, you know, he's obviously got to fit in there somewhere as well, I would say at some stage. Okay, and uh, you talked about boxing politics. The um, president of the WBA said that, um, well, he's quoted in saying that he would love to have David Hay as their champion again. Um, your thoughts on that? Yeah, well, you know, as I said earlier, David is an exciting fighter. Um, I don't think his recent opponents have been really up to, up to much. But, um, you know, look, if he is to fight Tony W, I'd, I'd certainly turn, uh, tune in and watch. Um, but whether he deserves to have a title shot or not, well, I mean, it's not for me to say, but, um, you know, I think fighting um, Mark Demore and Arnold Gergage or whatever his name is you know, probably doesn't really get you know, too highly ranked, I suppose. But, I mean, that's, yeah. Critics, that's would, critics, critics would stop you there, Matt, and say, well, OK, if it's fight, if 
if, if, if David Hayes going to get it, cop it, then shouldn't Shannon Briggs cop it for the sort of opposition he's been fighting? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Look, we've got no problem with that either. No, I can understand that completely. Um, <laughs> so Shannon, Shannon talks a good game, doesn't he? So yeah, he's, it's he's let's go champ, isn't it? Yeah, ad nauseum, mate. But um, <laughs> yeah, I, I don't have a problem with that either. Look, you know, that's that's a fact. You know, if you go through Shannon's last, I don't know, eight, nine, ten opponents, well, you've got to be a real boxing diehard or boxing tragic like myself to have heard of most of those guys. Um, you know, there's one or two names that I sort of recognised right off the top of my head, like Rafael Zambana Love, the Brazilian heavyweight, is yep. you know, a decent little journeyman that he beat on points. But yeah, a lot of those guys are sort of, you know, without being disrespectful, they're sort of club-level fighters that he's been beating. Um, he obviously does a very good job on the uh, self-promotion sort of circuit, if you know what I mean. Um, yeah, let's go champ and chasing Vladimir Klitschko around. Um, so, yeah, he, he's managed to get himself um, an opportunity, I guess. And, and you know, look... That probably is what makes him dangerous. He's going to be desperate because if he if he beats Lucas, well, it opens him up to all these huge fights. I mean, to be fair to him, he wanted to fight David Hay, didn't he? He, <laughs> he did. He did. He went over to the UK. And he went over to the UK and, and and fought on one of Hay's undercards. And I think the entire boxing world believes that Hay and Shannon Briggs will be meeting around this time this year. But you know, for whatever reason, David didn't seem too keen to mix it up with him. So you know, that's on David. Can this fight be made in Australia, or would it be more, or would it be more financially viable in America? Yeah, great question. Um, I'm certainly hoping that it can be made in Australia. I think it'd be, you know, the Australian public could, you know, we're denied a lot of sort of big, uh, big boxing fights over here. Really, to be honest with you, because you know, boxing is, it, you know, to be fair, it's a minority sport in Australia. Um, we don't have a huge population. Um, there hasn't been a heavyweight title fight in Australia since Jack Johnson beat Tommy Burns uh, on Boxing Day 1908. So um, that's a long time between drinks. So I'm hoping that you know the fight can get made in Australia. But I mean, look, you know, I'm sure there's going to be some sort of interest from other places. Um, where those places are at the moment, I can I can tell you, listeners, we don't know. Um, you know, the fight only got sanctioned uh, 12 hours ago, basically. Um, so it's very early doors at this stage. Now let's go into now Lucas Brown becoming heavyweight champion of the world and the the, the reception you got in Australia. What was that like? Oh, it's fantastic. Like, um, you know, the press love a winner, I guess. You know, it's, it's the same the world over. And the manner that he won the fight in Grozny was, was obviously sort of Rocky-esque, for lack of a better expression. Absolutely. Um, you know, he sat down hard in the sixth and, you know, people sort of already overlooking the fact that, you know, the sixth round went something like 20, 24, 25 seconds longer than it should have because Lucas was in trouble. And then the seventh round, where he was actually boxing quite well and was having the better of it, was cut short by, I think, 40-something seconds. So, wow. you know, we had our own little obstacle. Yeah, you know, it's on YouTube. You can go and look it for yourself. It's it's there. Um, so, you know, he had his own. we had our own obstacles to overcome. And, um, you know, for him to be trailing on points, uh, and he was trailing to, to Ruslan Shadai, who's, you know, he's been a great fighter over the years, he's, yeah, Two-time absolutely. world amateur champion, and and you know, he's only been beaten by um, Pavetkin and, and Kuchko uh, before Lucas knocked him out. So um, you know, for him to land that right hand and, and sit Ruslan down, uh, I, think, I think he's only been down by put down a couple of times in his career. Um, certainly never been stopped in the fashion that Lucas stopped him. I think Kuchko made him quit on his stool. But, absolutely. Um, yeah, you know, for him for him to land that right hand and then follow it up and get him out of there, well, that was. Yeah, it was enormous news in Australia. The, 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 the press were, you know, obviously wanting to speak to Lucas. He got a huge reception when he arrived back at Sydney Airport. And, um, you know, obviously it, it all turned sour a couple of weeks after that. Yeah, I mean, I've, I mean, I've spoken to Lucas again via social media. And I've always been, I've been critical of, you know, obviously he's not the most talented heavyweight in the world. But what he does no, bring no. is tremendous power. I've said that to him. And if he catches any heavyweight in the world and for him to get off the deck... To knock out Shagayev, that is not only shows tremendous balls, heart, guts to do that and to go out and get the win. He could have stayed down in the sixth. He could have stayed down. Absolutely. And, and that would have been Absolutely. that. So for him to get off the deck and to knock out Shagayev in his own backyard, that takes huge cojones, to, honestly. And I'm not just saying it because we're doing the interview. That's a fact. And, and that makes Lucas dangerous to any heavyweight in the world should he connect. Absolutely. I completely agree with you. I think that that win, um, 
is really underrated uh, by a lot of boxing fans. Uh, people don't really understand that, you know, I've read some things like, oh, Tyson Fury brought his own food and, and water and all this to Germany. And I'm, you know, I'm like, yeah, but mate, we didn't go to Germany. <laughs> we went to Grozny in Chechnya. And, uh, you know, while we were treated very well by the people there, it's, you know, it's, it's not as easy to sort of tee things up when you're, <laughs> you're in the middle of, in the middle of uh, Chechnya. It's a different sort of place. And, you know, there were, there were seven people cheering for Lucas Brown in that um, that stadium, ten thousand that night or whatever. And and out of that seven, I actually include Lucas <laughs> Lucas Brown and probably six other people. But um, <laughs> you know, I also think you know you'd probably go a long way to it'd be close to the, the best heavyweight fight that's been this year. I think in terms of drama and things like that. Um, I agree. You know, Lucas isn't you know the second coming of Larry Holmes or anything like that or, or Muhammad Ali. It's, you don't really see him too much up on his toes, but he, he showed that he could do that against Shagai. He, mm-hmm. he sort of reinvented himself. People thought he was going to come forward like, you know, a flat-footed sort of slugger, but go and have a look at the tape. You know, I encourage your, your listeners to go and have a look at the tape, but he, he was actually boxing and things like that. And a lot of that credit goes to Rodney Williams, his new trainer. Um, so, you know, I think he showed a lot of ticker, uh, a lot of heart, and um, to overcome that sort of odds. Yeah, he, he, look, if Lucas connects with anyone in, in any heavyweight, He'll knock him down. No, no two ways about that. He knows he's not a defensively genius sort of fighter or anything like that. But anyone who fights him is in for a fight. That's a fact. Absolutely, which makes the Briggs fight so exciting because you know Briggs carries a great chin and power. Yeah. Lucas carries tremendous yeah. power, and he's not going to be going backwards. He's going to be he's going to be coming forward. So it's a tremendous fight. It really is, regardless of what you say about Briggs not fighting this opponent and that opponent. The power he brings. That's that's. You know that carries a lot of weight, that power. If you if you step back and just look at the fight, uh, you know Brown versus Briggs, yeah. it will be explosive. I think I think heavyweight, well, boxing fans, I should say, will be, you know, they'll be happy with the result come fight time. You know, it's it, it's one of those fights where anything can happen, and it could happen really quickly too. It could be over in a round and a half. It could be over in two rounds. It could, you know, Briggs could go the distance. He's shown a great chin against Vitaly and things like that. You know, yeah. Um, Lucas has got balls the size of watermelons, so you know he's not going to get out of there easily either. So I think it's a it's a great fight. I think it's an exciting sort of fifty fifty sort of fight. Do do the memories of George Foreman fighting uh, Michael Mora come to any light when you think about Briggs, his age, and Lucas Brown? That's a little bit. Um, I must admit, I read I read something on on Twitter earlier about you know. Briggs is looking to become the first heavyweight champion in three different decades. He obviously beat George Foreman and was, was a lineal champion then. And, and obviously then he beat um, Sergei Leokovic in, um, in the 2000s. I think maybe 2005 off the top of my head, I'm not sure. Yeah. Um, and, you know, he's obviously looking to do that this year. So, um, yeah, I, look, we've got to be wary. I, I spoke to Lucas on the phone and I just said, you know, this bloke, I think, has the most first-round knockouts out of any former heavyweight champion. You can't. Mm-hmm. You know, even if he is sort of knocking up a lot of them against sort of you know, club fighters, well, he's still knocking them out. So you got to you got to pay that respect to him early. And David didn't take the fight, so that'll tell you something. Well, that tells you everything you need to know. So I'll leave that one there. <laughs> so okay, let, let's let's track back a little bit more. I want to go back to the the new trainer, and I want to talk about the bit about I think Nigel Ben was involved, was he, or was that just? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's true. Right. Yep. That Nigel um, Rodney was Williams. Involved. Yeah, that's right. Yep. Rodney Williams trains Nigel Ben uh, here in Australia. Um, Nigel's still an incredible specimen of a, of a man. He's, he's fitter than, I'd say, most active fighters anyway. Um, and um, when Lucas was looking for a new trainer after leaving Jeff Fennick, he, um I was contacted by a mutual friend who said, look, I, I think you should come down to Sydney and, and watch Rodney Williams put Nigel through the paces and that sort of thing. And, um, you know, I did that and they hit it off really well. Like Rodney's a real sort of no nonsense sort of guy. Um, no ego as well. That's probably the most important thing. And he right. he um, he really gelled well with Lucas. And you know he's really big on on things like footwork and things like that. So he had Lucas doing all these footwork drills for weeks and weeks and weeks, uh, ladder drills, all that sort of stuff. Just getting those feet moving. And a lot of probably your listeners over there won't be aware, but Lucas was a, a very talented rugby league player here in Australia. He was yes. um, I think an under twenties. Uh, player for the Parramatta Reels, which is a, uh, uh, an NR, a national rugby league club here in Australia, of very high standing. Um, so, you know, he was on the wing there, um, which obviously usually requires a bit of footwork. So he, he had it in him. It's just more sort of getting those feet moving again 
Um, and Rodney was able to do that. I mean, look, the result in Chechnya speaks for itself. And the manner that he boxed, I think, is the greatest sort of illustration of that. He, everyone's seen Lucas sort of come forward, plant his feet, swing for the hills and yeah, knock people out. But he actually probably outboxed Shagayev and, and it was his boxing that walked Shagayev onto that, that big right hand. Absolutely. Um, are you able to divulge the, the reason why the breakdown between Lucas Brown and, and Fennec was? Or is that just something you don't want to talk about? No, that's fine. Um, no, look, it's nothing personal. I just think that um, probably their, their styles didn't didn't gel as well. That's probably all it really came down to. It's, you know, you, you need to have a real understanding and you know uh, of the boxer and trainer, and they've got to gel. And I think that you know that sort of level, you need to make sure that everyone's on the same page. I sort of say Jeff Warren because Jeff's trained some good fighters here in Australia and all the rest of it. It's just that. They just maybe didn't, you know, their personalities maybe didn't gel or anything like that. There was no big falling out or anything like that. It was just sort of, ah. you know, I'm, I'm going to try go go different, so different route or whatever. And, and Rodney Williams, you know, he, he fits like a glove, mate. He's, he's perfect for like us. Fantastic. So, OK, let's let's get to the big thing now. The whole drug allegation, the yeah. the suspension. The... Talk to me, in your Absolutely. opinion, on how, how things happened. Yeah, no problem. How long have you got? <laughs> um, <laughs> mate, where do I start? Okay, so, um, look, we went to Grozny, obviously, and it was, in the in the negotiations, it was our team that demanded drug testing. And we knocked back Rosada, the Russian anti-doping, and obviously, in light of what's going on at the Rio Olympics, it probably was a, a smart decision. Um, we got... We demanded that VADA do the testing. I believe they're American-based. Uh, they arrived on the Monday, I believe, um, and did a. We were having breakfast down there in, in the hotel, and um, they sort of tapped Lucas on the shoulder and said, "Look, we're from VADA. You know, showed their ID and said we're, we're going to do a random test after breakfast." And Lucas is like, "No problem." So we went up to the room, and he provided a blood and urine analysis uh, for testing. And as it would turn out later, that was completely clean. Now, on the Saturday night, it was probably actually the early hours of Sunday morning after the fight, really, um, he provided a urine, uh, post-fight urine test, and that came back with a trace element of clenbuterol. Um, to be honest with you, at the time when the news broke, I didn't really have a great understanding of clenbuterol. I'd, I'd heard of it and all the rest of it, but I didn't exactly know what it did. So we obviously did homework and lots of stuff, and uh, it's a weight stripper, and uh, I believe it's also a bronchiolator or something like that, if that... If that word's correct. Right. Um, we we uh, obviously sent hair samples off to America to be tested independently. And one thing I didn't know before was that uh, the root of your hair is actually very similar to the inside of a tree. So when you cut down a tree, there's rings on it and you can tell how old the tree is. It's very similar on the root of your hair. You can analyse it and tell how long something's been in your system because it, it's retained in the root of the hair. Uh, the testing came back that categorically uh, he was clean upon entering Chechnya and that the amount there was consistent with a single dosage of clenbuterol. So now, again, if you do your research on clenbuterol, you would know that you need to cycle it and it's, you know, taking it one off. The uh, One of the um, uh, experts that we, we spoke to said that taking it as a one-off would actually have a negative effect on his performance. It increases your heart rate by up to three times. Uh, it causes sleeplessness, jitteriness, headaches, the whole box and dice. On top of that, he's a heavyweight. He can weigh whatever he wants. Now, he, I was there with every meal that he ate in Grozny. He was eating a mountain of food. He's a big guy. He burns it off. So he knew he was in good shape. His weight's not an issue because he's a heavyweight. Isn't it? There's no difference to him if he weighs 116 kilos, 112 kilos, 100, whatever. It doesn't matter. Um... So on top of that, we all knew that none of us were taking a banned substance through both Australian and Russian customs. It's not going to happen. We're not stupid. So, um, yeah, it all didn't add up. We got the news. We went through everything, every vitamin that he was taking, every uh, supplement. Obviously, none of it was, um, was dodgy. He even told me, he goes... I didn't even take a pre-workout before the fight. But, you know, most guys will take a pre-workout. You're allowed to. It's no problem. It's, he goes, I didn't even do that. He goes, I didn't even take my multivitamins, uh, you know, four or five days out from the fight. So it just, it stunk to the high heavens. Um, I can't point a finger at someone and say that person did it or this is how it happened. I, 
I don't really know. Um, my guess is that if I had to have a guess, uh, the, the night after the weigh-in, so the night before the fight, we went to a, um, a function where all the fighters were introduced to the crowd and the president was there and the, the press and lots of stuff. And, you know, they all got on the scales again, but it wasn't a real weigh-in. It was just they, they brought up on a computer the, um, the weight that they already weighed in that day. Now, there was all finger food on the table. All the boxes got served a steak. They didn't request it. It was all put in front of them. If I was going to have a guess, well, I guess it was in the state, but I don't know that. That's just me having a guess. Um, so, yeah, unfortunately, we we um, we were stripped of the title you know, only a couple of weeks after after winning it, and sadly, um, his reputation took an absolute beating. And um, you know, the press will turn on you as quick as you know, as quick as they can build someone up, they'll tear him down too. So, he took a hell of a beating over here in Australia, and. Um, we fought tooth and nail to clear his name, obviously, and Leon Margulies, his, um, his, his lawyer, uh, was instrumental in that. Like I said, we, we, we even flew in from Perth to Sydney to take part in a, uh, a polygraph test, like a lie detector test. Now, obviously, that's not going to prove anyone's innocence or anything like that, but he passed the test of flying colours, and it just sort of weigh, adds weight of evidence, I guess, to what you're trying to prove. Um, the WBA stripped him without hearing our side of the story, and, um, I mean, look, they, they banned him for six months, and I think if you read between the lines, well, that's usually like a two-year offence. So they banned him for six months, so you can probably draw your own conclusions there. So what about loss of earnings during that six months? Lucas could have fought then. Did you go for that? He could have. Well, he, look, you know, at the end of the day, that's what, part of my argument is, well, they only banned him for six months, and at that level, you probably don't fight in that six months anyway. So it's kind of like... I thought they were sort of almost sort of saying, well, you know, we know something might have gone on, but, you know, have, here's a six-month ban when it could, it could have been two years. But, but we weren't happy with that. We wanted to clear his name. We know he'd done nothing wrong. So, I mean, you don't, you don't pass, you don't request drug testing, pass a random test, and then be told while you're doing the random test, we can come back at any time tomorrow, the next day, the day after that, to take one, you know, dosage of clenbuterol to... Um, the expert said it would probably cause him to lose less than half a kilogram. So what is the point of that? Um, so, yeah, we fought tooth and nail to clear his name. And, and obviously, you know, that's it's all been put out on the, on the, in the press as well. And we, we took the WBA to court to, to prove his innocence. And eventually they looked at our, our case. And as you know, they came back saying that, you know, it's through no fault of his own. So here we are fighting again to the belt that he probably already should have. Um, and we're right back where we were. Fantastic. That clears up a lot of things, and uh, it's good to hear it from the manager rather than hear it via social media, which brings me on to my next yeah. point. Um, social media, Lucas Brown, very, very friendly on social media, <laughs> retweeting almost everything. The retweet, the retweet king. The he definitely is the retweet king. king. Retweet. Yes. Um, <laughs> Lucas, he, he does have a, <coughs> certainly has a reputation on, on Twitter for these things, retweeting. What's your views on the whole social media <laughs> comments from the fans what are your thoughts on it and um, Lucas's? you've got to I, I like it i mean i think the, the positives far outweigh the negatives um okay. you, you know you go back sort of 20 or 15 20 years ago there was you know you'd read about here in australia you'd be reading about you know the the, the champions in you know ko magazine and ring magazine yeah. and things like that but now you can actually now you can use you can usually sort of interact with them so from a fan's point of view, I think it's a tremendous thing. Um, obviously, the downside to that is it gives, if someone wants to be a dickhead, well, they've, you know, they've got a platform to deliver it. So, but look, I take that with a grain of salt. You know, I've been, I've been uh, given plenty of, plenty of stick over the time and so, obviously so are the athletes. It's far more important than me. But look, I, you know, you take the good with the bad. And I think, I think as, a, as a whole, I think it's a great thing. You know, you can, you can ask someone a question, you can, you know, you can ask Lucas a question; he'll always usually get back to you. Um, I think, I think it's a plus. Fantastic. Um, just on the closing note, Tyson Fury, the unified champion, who has been stripped of his belts and it's caused complete chaos in the heavyweight division. But everyone is moving yeah. on their business, claiming that they're going to be champions, title holders, belt holders, whatever. Um, what are your thoughts yeah. on Tyson Fury's situation? 
Um, I really like Tyson Fury. I think he's a, a breath of fresh air. He certainly was a breath of fresh air for the heavyweight division when he beat Vladimir. Um, I'm a big fan. <laughs> um, I hope that he overcomes whatever mental problems he's got going on at the moment, his uh, depression or whatever, and I really hope he overcomes that and he does it quickly. I'd love to see him back in the mix straight away. Um, uh, I believe he's got the, the cocaine sort of thing hanging over his head or whatever. Um, mm-hmm. you know, let's hope he can clear all that up as, as quick as possible and, and and get back on to what he does best, and that's boxing. Um, he is the lineal heavyweight champion. No matter how you slice it and dice it, whether he's stripped or not of his other belts, um, he is the lineal champion. He's the guy who beat the guy, you know, that's, that was Vladimir Klitschko for 10 years. He, he beat him. So, and he, he was a, it was a great performance. Um, unfortunately, his uh, issues outside of the ring have sort of come to the fore. But, yeah, I hope he overcomes it and gets back in there. Uh, Joshua, the uh, IBF title holder, champion, he, uh, he defends his title against um, Eric Molina on December the 10th. Yep. Any thoughts on, on a possible Brown Joshua fight? Has there ever been any negotiations about that? No, nah, there's been no talk at all about that. But you know, Joshua's a great, great champion as well. But um, you know, you got to remember that he sort of fought for the IBF title after Fury was stripped of it a week and a half later, and he sort of fought Charles Martin or whatever his name was um, for the title. So you know, look, he's a great champion. Um, I wouldn't completely sleep on Eric Molina. I think, you know, people keep bringing up Molina got knocked out by Chris Ariel in the round and things like that. Yeah, he did, but that's boxing. Like, you don't understand, at that level, you take a shot on the chin, especially in the early rounds, anything can happen. You can, but they, you know, that could be the end of it. That's they also look, forget Molina, boxing. Molina hurt Ariola before he got knocked out. They don't talk about that bit. Exactly. Exactly. If you go and watch the replay, Molina lands a beautiful right hand. I think it's like a double jab right hand. And, yep. And... Chris sort of took a backward step and, you know, the knee dipped a little bit and lots of stuff. And, you know, to Chris's credit, he, he came straight back and landed a good shot back. And that's heavyweight boxing. I, I think one, if I could have one criticism of boxing, it's, um, you know, a loss is so detrimental. And I don't really see the point. To me, it's like, if you're involved in a good contest where people are like, that was a fun fight, I don't think you should be penalised for that. Absolutely. Um, you know, that's the sort of thing that leads to sort of safe matchmaking, I think. So... Um, I'm not sure exactly how boxing overcomes that. Maybe it's something that needs to develop over time. But um, I'm not a big fan, per se, of the UFC. I'll watch Conor McGregor and things like that. But um, one thing that they do well, and I think mm-hmm. they do better than boxing, is that if you have a loss, as long as it's a good loss and it's fun to watch, you're back in there again. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, I wouldn't... You know, look, Joshua might come out and, and slam Molina in a round or two, but I wouldn't I wouldn't sleep on him either. Molina, he'll load up with that right hand and, you know... It doesn't matter who you are. If you get hit in the spot, you're going. So um, I think it's a fun fight for what, you know, I think Eddie's done pretty well to, to make that because obviously he was banking on the Klitschko fight being made. Um, so, you know, and Molina, he's got a lot of heart. He went over, I don't know if you've seen his fight with Adamak, but he you know, went over to Poland, you know, again, trailing on the cards um, in Poland and, and knocked out Thomas Adamak. So, yeah, it's got, I think it's going to be a fun fight. I'm actually looking forward to it. And I think... If I'm correct, I think White's fighting Chisora on the undercard as well. Yep. So, good fight. Yeah, happy days. Matt Clark, thank you so much for talking to Bayloric TV. We really appreciate you and we look forward to speaking to you soon. Not a problem. Don't Anytime. forget to hit that subscribe button. It's Ingrid Jones from Bayloric TV. We're out. Take care.